Whitaker presents the strange case of Oliver Cromwell's head. This is the admissions register recording the entry of Cromwell to the college as a fellow commoner, that is, a person who was entitled to the same food as the fellows of the college. He was admitted on the 23rd of April, 1616, when he was 17 or just 17? When he was... No, still 16. Uh, seven, still 16, yes, just a few days short of his mm. 17th birthday. For Nicholas Rogers, the archivist of Sydney Sussex College in Cambridge, this admissions register from 1616 is a prized possession, recording, as it does, the arrival there of the young Oliver Cromwell, undoubtedly the college's most famous member. Infamous, too, at times... After the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, the then master of Sydney Sussex added a few words next to Cromwell's name in the register, distancing himself from all he had stood for. Nicholas Rogers translates from the Latin. This was that great impostor, that most accursed butcher, who after the most pious King Charles I had been put to a shameful death, himself usurped the throne, and for the space of almost five years... Uh, vexed the three kingdoms with unrestrained tyranny under the name of Protector. There's no record of Oliver Cromwell ever returning to Sydney, Sussex in his lifetime, but a part of him was returned to the college just over 300 years after his death. As you enter the chapel, there's a vestibule, and on the wall is a plaque which reads, Near to this place was buried on 25th of March 1960 the head of Oliver Cromwell. Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland and Ireland, fellow commoner of this college, 1616-17. to 17. How and why did Cromwell's head, and no other part of his body, end up here? It's a strange and rather gruesome story that begins on September 3rd, 1658. It is remarkable how it pleased the Lord on this day to take him to rest, for which both himself and the day, September the 3rd, will be most renowned to posterity, it having been to him a day of triumphs, a day which after so many strange revolutions of providence he lived once again to see, and then to die, with great assurances and serenity of mind, peaceably in his bed. So a London newsletter, the Public Intelligencer, announced the death of Oliver Cromwell. He was not yet sixty. Mid-seventeenth century England was a country in which people searched constantly for signs of God's intentions, in which human affairs were read as the workings of divine providence. So much was made of a huge storm that raged across England as Cromwell lay on his deathbed, and much was made also of the fact that he died on September the 3rd, the very same day on which he had won two of his most significant military battles, at Dunbar in 1650 and at Worcester two years later. Here's the public intelligencer again. Thus it proved to him to be a day of triumph indeed, that having neglected an earthly crown, he should now go to receive the crown of everlasting life. Oliver Cromwell had indeed neglected an earthly crown, resisting those among his followers who'd wanted him to take the title of king in 1657. But he couldn't resist their desire to mourn and bury him as a king. Though his bowels were taken out, and his body filled with spices, wrapped in a six-fold seer cloth, but put first into a coffin of lead, and then into a wooden box, yet it purged and wrought through all, so that there was a necessity of interring it before the solemnity of his funeral. This account by his chief physician shows clearly that Cromwell was embalmed, an honour reserved for the very few in 17th century England, and a clear indication that, in death, he was to be treated as a king. He was buried privately at night in Henry the Seventh's chapel at Westminster Abbey, and for an elaborate lying in state at Somerset House, he was represented by a wood and wax effigy. The state funeral on November the twenty-third was modelled on that of King James the First. Saw the superb funeral of the Protector. He was carried from Somerset House on a velvet bed of state drawn by six horses, the pall held by his new lords. Oliver lying in effigy in royal robes, and crowned with a crown, scepter and orb, like a king. Which can only have seemed appallingly inappropriate to a royalist like the diarist John Evelyn. And he made a point of suggesting that there was no public reverence on display for the dead protector. It was the joyfulest funeral I ever saw. 
and there were none that cried but dogs, which soldiers hooted away with a barbarous noise, drinking and taking tobacco in the streets as they went. <laughs> Eighteen months later, the scenes on London streets were very different as Charles II returned to his capital. He was intent on making up for his long years of enforced exile. He was also intent on revenge. That the carcasses of Oliver Cromwell, Henry Ireton and John Bradshaw, whether buried in Westminster Abbey or elsewhere, be, with all expedition, taken up and drawn on a hurdle to Tyburn, and there hanged up for some time and after that buried under the said gallows. So read a grim order issued by the House of Commons on December the 4th, 1660. Cromwell was to be exhumed and posthumously executed. Alongside him were to be his son-in-law and confidant Henry Ireton and John Bradshaw, the lawyer who'd presided over the trial of Charles I in 1649. Samuel Pepys was no supporter of Cromwell, but he confided to his diary that it troubled him that a man of so great courage as he was should have that dishonour, though otherwise he might deserve it enough. Dishonour is perhaps too mild a word to describe the ghastly ceremony that took place in London on January the 30th, 1661. The date, of course, was symbolic, the 12th anniversary of the execution of Charles I, and for Blair Worden, research professor at Royal Holloway College London and an expert on Cromwell's life and subsequent reputation, the spectacle at Tyburn had a clear political message. The need to do it, I think, suggests the fear, the need to demonise Cromwell and the Republicans because they might come again. I mean, to us, in retrospect... 1660, with the restoration of the monarchy, seems one of the great, obvious dividing lines of English history, like 1066, 1485. At the time, uh, the regime knew that it had come back on a wave of popularity, but it knew how fickle public opinion in such matters uh, was. And the fear that the king will have to go on his travels again is quite an important influence, I think, within the new government. So it's necessary to demonise Cromwell and the regicides. The three bodies had been exhumed four days previously and then kept at an inn in Hoburn. Early on the morning of the 30th, they were loaded onto carts and pulled through the city to the gallows at Tyburn, near the present-day Marble Arch. Bradshaw had been dead for little more than a year and his body had not been embalmed. It was green and stank, one report said. Another that the populace pelted the regicides with stones, brickbats and mud all the way to Tyburn. Waiting there gleefully was John Evelyn. This day, oh, the stupendous and inscrutable judgments of God, were the carcasses of those arch-rebels, Cromwell, Bradshaw, the judge who condemned His Majesty, and Ireton, son-in-law to the usurper, dragged out of their superb tombs in Westminster among the kings to Tyburn, and hanged on the gallows there from nine in the morning till six at night, and then buried under that fatal and ignominious monument in a big pit. Thousands of people who had seen them in their pride being spectators. Evelyn doesn't mention what happened after Cromwell and Bradshaw's bodies were cut down and before they were thrown into the pit. The executioner decapitated them. In Cromwell's case, and this will become important evidence centuries later, needing more than one swing of the axe to finish the job. Oliver Cromwell's head and trunk were now separate objects. The former, together with those of Bradshaw and Ireton, were stuck on the end of a long oak post topped with a metal spike and placed on the roof of Westminster Hall. But was Cromwell's headless body really thrown into that pit? Or, if it was, did someone retrieve it? There are those who don't believe his bones are somewhere under Marble Arch, but rather 300 miles away on the edge of the North Yorkshire Moors. Well, this is one of the ones of Mary Cromwell, a full-length portrait of her. She married the first Earl of Falkenberg. He'd been a, a staunch royalist originally and had actually fought against Cromwell in the Civil War. He'd lost his position in court circles and any influence he might have, so what better way than to get back into the power of the country than by marrying Mary Cromwell? <laughs> 
Sir George Woomwell is talking about a portrait in one of the main reception rooms at Newborough Priory, not far from Thirsk, that a forebearer of his acquired by marrying into the Falkenberg family in the 1820s. It's an architectural jumble of a house, part medieval, part Tudor, part Georgian, and what's most special about it is hidden away on the top floor. And this was a staff staircase, steep and narrow, leading actually straight up to Cromwell's tomb. And uh, here it is at the top of the house, immediately above the front door of the property. It's an unprepossessing structure built into the eaves. All one can see is a painted brick wall and a simple timber covering. The story that's been passed down over the centuries is that Mary Cromwell and her husband managed to retrieve Oliver's body and brought it to Newborough so that it would be safe from any royalist retribution. One version, which Sir George Woomwell holds to, is that they bribed a guard at Westminster Abbey to swap Cromwell's body for another before the exhumation. Another, that seems more likely, is that they removed the headless body from Tyburn. All these questions could be answered, of course, by opening the tomb, but that, Sir George insists, will never happen. So, what is inside, do you know? Absolutely no idea at all. Very much a family tradition that it's uh, been asked of the heir not to open it. If he is, in fact, here, then he should now rest in peace. Do you believe that his body is in there? I certainly do. It, it all sort of ties in, and nobody else claims to have his body. So you own the bones? Oh, absolutely, yes. But probably, it seems fair to say, not the head. Certainly at the time, no one suggested that the severed head taken from Tyburn to be displayed on Westminster Hall in January 1661 was anything other than Cromwell's. And that it was still there in 1684, 23 years later, is confirmed by a newspaper report on the execution of a participant in the Rye House plot against Charles II. His head, the article said, was set up on Westminster Hall betwixt those of Cromwell and Bradshaw. But then, and for much of the 18th century, when governments were frequently condemned as ineffectual or venal, Cromwell came to be viewed more charitably by many in England. Blair Worden again. Once the generation that remembers the Civil War dies, you begin to get slightly more standing back, a willingness to see virtues even in a figure whom one might condemn on other grounds, to say, yes, he acquired power by evil means, but the actual uses that he made of it, he reformed the legal system, he appointed judges impartially, it was, wasn't a corrupt regime. Is there a sense also in the 18th century that um, he was a truly English leader, as opposed to monarchs who weren't English, they were either Dutch or, or Hanoverian? I think that's right, and Cromwell's Englishness is something that he himself had, had, had emphasised. So it must have been both startling and somewhat unsettling when an object that was claimed to be Cromwell's embalmed head appeared on the London Curio Market. A German traveller recounted a visit to a private museum in London in 1710, where he was shown what he was assured was Cromwell's head. He was told it was available for 60 guineas. Then, sometime around the mid-18th century, the master of Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge, Dr Ellison, received an unexpected visitor. He was described as a comedian, and he wanted to know if the college might be interested in buying Cromwell's head, which he just happened to have in his bag. The story he told them was that some time after the heads had been spiked, a high wind one night broke that on which Oliver's was fixed. A soldier, going by early in the morning, took it up with the spike in it and carried it home. The head being missed, and it being supposed that it was taken away by one of Oliver's party, a considerable award was offered for the discovery of the person who had it in his possession. This frightened the soldier, who concealed it, and at his death it remained in the family. The comedian married the granddaughter of the soldier, and as Dr. Ellison humorously observed, had Oliver's head to her portion. Dr. Ellison declined to purchase it. This account, from later in the 18th century, is extremely important, as it provides the only narrative ever produced for how Cromwell's head disappeared from Westminster Hall at some time after 1684. It might sound far-fetched, but it's all we have. 
The comedian was an unsuccessful actor called Samuel Russell from Cambridgeshire, whose family was reputedly related to the Cromwells. He obviously regarded the head as insurance for his old age, and he was finally successful in selling it in 1787. It was bought for £118 by Samuel Cox, a London jeweller and moneylender, who evidently also thought he could make money out of the gruesome relic. In 1799, he organised a special exhibition near Bond Street of what he advertised as the real embalmed head of Oliver Cromwell. There was an accompanying guidebook for visitors. It may be noticed that one of the ears is missing. This is accounted for by another of the family traditions, which is that when the protector's relations and admirers were occasionally admitted to see the head, they took those opportunities to pilfer such small parts as could best be come at, or were least likely to be missed. But Cromwell, even in the context of the French Revolutionary Wars, obviously wasn't all that much of a visitor attraction and Samuel Cox quickly sold the head on to a consortium, who, in turn, in 1814, sold it to a Mr. Josiah Henry Wilkinson. This is the crucial turning point in the history of this strange object, because Josiah Wilkinson did not treat the head as an investment, but as something to be respected and, insofar as this was possible, researched. Wilkinson was quick to assert that what he'd bought could only be the real thing. Examining this wonderful matter critically, a consideration of the greatest importance is that you will not find in all history an account of a head being first embalmed and then spiked, except Oliver Cromwell's. For these circumstances, being the two extremes of honour and disgrace, they never met before nor since in the same person. The noblemen who were traitors were beheaded, and their heads spiked but not embalmed. Oliver was embalmed and buried as a potentate, and afterwards hung and spiked as a delinquent. But while Josiah Wilkinson refused any public display of the head, it was evidently something of a party piece in his own household. In March 1822, a friend of his sister's wrote in a letter, But to go back to our breakfast, we saw, what do you think, Oliver Cromwell's head? Not his picture, not his bust, nothing of stone or marble or plaster of Paris, but his real head, which is now in the possession of Mr. Ricardo's brother-in-law. Mr. Wilkinson dotes upon it. A frightful skull it is, covered with its parched yellow skin like any other mummy, and with its chestnut hair, eyebrows and beard in glorious preservation. The head is still fastened to the inestimable broken bit of the original pole, all black and happily worm-eaten. By this bit of pole, Mr and Mrs Ricardo and family by turns held up the head opposite the window, while we stood in the window and the happy possessor lectured upon it, compasses in hand. Though the head was in private hands, its public significance in early Victorian England couldn't but be affected by a sea change in the reputation of Cromwell himself. This was spurred by the publication in 1845 of Thomas Carlyle's magisterial edition of the Protector's Letters and Speeches. Blair Worden has no doubt as to the book's impact. Huge. It brought Cromwell alive in a way that he never had been before. Carlyle said if you read his words. You will find an authentic uh, human being, an earnest uh, struggler for truth uh, and for godliness. And his book had a huge impact, particularly uh, on nonconformists who found in Cromwell a figure close to themselves. On the other hand, Carlyle didn't achieve it by himself. Public opinion had been changing. There had been a shift, a gradual, sh slow shift in favour of Cromwell since the early 19th century. And in 1845, the year that Carlyle's great work appears, uh, there was a great battle in the press over the question whether in the newly built Houses of Parliament, where there were going to be statues of all England's kings, whether there should be a statue of Cromwell himself. Now, uh, there wasn't after quite a long debate, but there was a great deal of support for it. Working class radicals and chartists in the middle of the 19th century see him as a, as a hero. No matter that Carlyle himself dismissed claims for the Wilkinson's head being the real thing as fraudulent moonshine. Admiration for Cromwell affected attitudes towards his remains. In 1857, the Dean of Westminster asked to see the head, after which he wrote to his sister, A very awful apparition, 
and I myself believe it can be no one's but Cromwell's own. But the Protector's chief cheerleader was the popular historian Frederick Harrison, whose biography of Cromwell appeared in 1888. He deemed it far from improbable that Cromwell's body was interred at Newborough Priory in Yorkshire, and he wanted the Wilkinson head verified. Then they could be reunited. The quickened conscience of the nation might yet reverse a deed which dishonours our monarchy and stains our annals, and the bones of the greatest ruler this country ever had might again be laid to rest beside the heroes and statesmen of England. In fact, the Dean of Westminster sounded out Queen Victoria on Cromwell being reburied in the Abbey, but the palace said no. Such opposition from the royal family to any honouring of the late Lord Protector was hardly surprising. But the 300th anniversary of his birth in 1899 saw his statue erected in the precinct of the Houses of Parliament. It was paid for by Lord Rosebery, briefly the Liberal Prime Minister between 1894 and 95. In his speech at the unveiling, he praised Cromwell's faith in God and freedom and in the influence of Great Britain in asserting both. With the exception of a few Irish nationalists, there was virtually no parliamentary opposition to the statue, which, for Blair Worden, shows how much things had changed since the 1840s. There is, if you like, growing acceptance by the establishment of, of Cromwell and a readiness, if you like, almost to absorb him, I mean, to regard him as part of the English heritage, to a large extent taken on board by 1899. And I think that's why the centenary celebrations of 1899, the centenary celebrations of his birth, when he's so widely portrayed as the greatest Englishman, perhaps the greatest man in the history of the world, why that can take off. In fact, it proves to be, I think, the great climax, almost the end of the cult of Cromwell, which is not merely partisan, but is almost national, I think, by the end of the 19th century. So it was hardly surprising that when, in April 1911, the Royal Archaeological Institute persuaded the Wilkinson family to allow them to put Cromwell's head on show, it created huge interest. Members of the Institute were presented with learned papers arguing for and against the head's authenticity, and the exhibition was not open to the public. But a photo of the relic was published in the Daily Express, and letters to the editor poured in. There are probably few people who do not recognise that Cromwell was among the greatest Englishmen who ever lived. Cannot a subscription be raised to purchase the relic and give it a decent burial? I enclose a cheque, in case you care to undertake... The ruthless treatment to which the remains of Oliver Cromwell were subjected 260 years ago is a stain on our common humanity. The by now extremely elderly historian Frederick Harrison put his oar in, complaining of the sacrilegious abomination of this venerable relic's present treatment, and Prime Minister Asquith was asked in the comments if he could not purchase the head for the nation. He declined to do so. Eventually, on April the 20th, the Times decided enough was enough. The whole discussion seems to us to be no very edifying one. We shall probably never know for certain whether the head is that of Cromwell or not. And, this being so, it seems rather a ghastly proceeding to make it the subject of periodical examination and controversy. To which Harrison replied in a letter, Sir, those who feel a keen interest in this heart-rending question will not be able to follow the advice you gave them to let it rest. Too true. Speculation about the head's authenticity rumbled on, and finally, in 1935, the Wilkinson family decided to try and put an end to it once and for all. They sent the head to the biometric laboratory at University College London, where two scientists, Pearson and Morant, subjected it to a painstaking evaluation. They consulted 17th century manuals on embalming, and concluded that the head had indeed been treated in an historically appropriate manner and they posed perhaps the most important question of all. If the Wilkinson head was not that of Cromwell, yet had been claimed to be so for centuries, then it was an intentional forgery. Pearson and Morant painstakingly undermined such a possibility. It may be said, almost with certainty, that the head was separated from the body after embalmment. In other words, the forgers, if such existed, must have embalmed a large portion of the fresh corpse and then proceeded to chop off the head with an axe in the crudest possible manner. There was, before 1799, 
no published record of the Tyburn treatment of Cromwell's corpse, stating that the executioner made a failure in his first blows, so that the assumed forgers would have no reason for mimicking such a procedure. Finally, they concluded that they felt there to be a moral certainty that the Wilkinson head is the genuine head of Oliver Cromwell, protector of the Commonwealth. <laughs> The choir of Sydney Sussex College sing music by Thomas Tompkins, a significant and royalist composer who died in 1656, when Cromwell was at the height of his powers. They were recorded last year in the college chapel, which is where, in March 1960, a small group had gathered for a bizarre and poignant ceremony. In discussion between the representative of the family and the master, the idea was settled on that it should be buried so that it remained out of sight and so that it was in a sense at rest. It was uh, arranged that it should be private and in the vacation and I think fellows were asked to go if they wanted to but in fact only the master and four fellows and two representatives of the Wilkinson family were present when it was buried in the antechapel, and uh, I'm the last of them. Derek Beals is Emeritus Professor of Modern History at Cambridge and has been a Fellow of Sydney Sussex since 1955. He and his colleagues were told that the Wilkinson family had had enough of the head and all the controversy connected with it and had offered it to the Protector's old college. They accepted the offer, albeit with a certain trepidation and Derek Beals remembers the lengths they went to to make sure the relic was buried in a watertight container. We happened to have among our fellows then the professor of uh, inorganic chemistry, who Professor Emma Lairs, and he was consulted. And what was done, as I recall, was that what I think of as a quite large zinc biscuit tin was lined with plastic and then various preservative... Um, powders were put round it in order to protect it but of course um, it is not our intention to look and see whether this has succeeded The plaque in the anti-chapel at Sydney Sussex refers to the head of Oliver Cromwell not the purported or alleged head. That long debate seems finally to have been put to rest as well As to precisely where the head is, that is a closely guarded secret the Strange Case of Oliver Cromwell's Head was written and presented by Mark Whitaker. The readers were Roy Carruthers and Paul Green. It was a Square Dog radio production for BBC Radio 4.